Hi, everyone. I want to welcome you to another session of Philosophical Talks with Stephen Friedman. Today, Mr. Friedman is going to talk to us about Earth Day, which was last week on April 22nd. But our philosophy at American Space Almighty and the U.S. Consulate and the U.S. Mission in Kazakhstan is that Earth Day should be celebrated every day and that we should all be taking steps uh, to make sure that our impact on this planet is one that uh, is healthy and good for uh, including other animals. So the um, U.S. Mission and American Space Almighty in particular will be having other programs in the near future um, related to Earth Day. Um, next week will be Air Quality Week and we'll have a few programs that will be presented to uh, rec in recognition of that. So please do check out our Facebook pages, uh, both uh, for the mission and the consulate, and also uh, at American Space Almaty. Uh, with that, I am gonna turn it over to Stephen Friedman, who has in the past been referred to uh, by the New York Times as a genius philosopher. So, uh, so we really are getting to talk to an actual philosopher in modern day world. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Stephen. Thanks. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, I also wanna thank Aliyah, Amira, um, Dana, and Consul General Eric Meyer for the opportunity to continue to give these weekly talks on philosophy and its applications to diverse topics and issues problems and solutions. This tonight's talk is going to focus on Earth Day, but from probably a little different perspective than most of the encounters you might be having with this event. Um, I actually wanna begin with an appreciation about the Earth, of the Earth. Um, then I'll deal more with like measure, you know, considerations relating to the effect we have on the world um, and the kinds of approaches we can take in principle to oh, improving the, the health of the planet, um, make, make, making sure it is able to maintain conditions that are compatible with our survival and the survival of other species that have developed you know, under fairly limited, um, narrow environmental circumstances. Um, any living organism is adapted to a fairly narrow range of conditions. And if those conditions change dramatically, sufficiently, well, then that environment, that, that planet, that world can become incompatible with the continued existence of that species. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that. I'll talk about that more towards the second half of the talk. Um, I am, last week's talk was, as, as is usual with my talks, um, longer than I had anticipated simply because again, I never you know, script these and, and I don't quite know exactly how much time I'm gonna end up spending on a given topic or story or, or issue. The second part of the talk, I didn't have time to complete. I'm not going to be addressing it tonight. It was on the poetry of philosophy, but I'm going to be dealing with a little bit of poetry tonight um, partly in a philosophical, partly in a non-philosophical context, um, because in addition to having been Earth Week last week, the month of April in the United States is National Poetry Month. So um, I thought that would, so poetry, the earth and philosophical issues make a reasonable convergence. When the topic of Earth Day um, suggested itself. First thing that came to mind was a poem. A poem that I had written some years ago when I was writing poetry inspired by the names of people. You know, um, not what the, the names might signify the meaning of the name, but the sound. 
For me, the writing of poetry is distinguished by an attentiveness to the sound, the rhythm, you know, of, of the words predominantly. When I write philosophical aphorisms, I'm concerned about the sound, um, the um, actual, you know, the grammatical construction, the rhythm of the aphorism, but that's actually secondary to the, you know, the thought content, the idea that the aphorism is expressing. In the case of poetry that I've written, what's primary is the music of the language, the music of the words. A poem for me always starts with a rhythmic pattern, with words that suggest a certain rhythm, maybe a certain rhyme. It doesn't begin with a specific idea. And as in the case of my art as well, the initial, the initial line, um, in the case of the, the visual art that I do, the initial image um, determines the direction of the entire work, controls it, so that from that initial moment, which might be influenced by you know, what I'm thinking, again, what rhythm might happen to enter my mind, from that point on, the act of writing the poem, completing the poem, is more an act of self-discipline than self-expression. I'm trying to be true to what has initially suggested itself. Okay, so the poem that first suggested itself to me was, was the following. Stephanie cannot be what will set the muses free. Stephanie need not find what would make the heart grow kind. Stephanie does not seem like the edges of a dream but in Kant's an earlier time when the earth was sacred rhyme. Now, obviously what's key, you know, for this occasion in that poem is the conclusion, but in Kant's an earlier time when the earth was sacred rhyme. For me, the, that sense of sacred sound, sacred poetry intersects my fundamental philosophical um, work on developing, well, the logic of Eden, which this earth, for me, ultimately embodies, represents when seen properly, when seen philosophically, when seen rigorously, when seen epistemically, right? That what is around us is, in fact, what the religions have imagined to be what, mystical union with God, nirvana, enlightenment, Eden, the landscape of Eden when it is seen through rigorous eyes, when it's seen in its, in its precision, when it's recognized in terms of its distinctiveness point by point so that it escapes conceptualization. Well. Okay, so fundamental to my sense of the world, um, to many people's sense, sense of this world, and, and, and what I've seen embodied in a lot of poetry about the earth is its colors, right? It's, it's blues and greens predominantly. That's featured in a number of you know, poetic and philosophic embodiments that I've, that I've generated over the years. One, an aphorism that encapsulates a lot of what I've just been describing, it goes like this, and it was written many years ago. Blues, greens, aquamarines. Who could have imagined? Now, the, the thinking behind that aphorism, the inspiration for it, is the idea that, again, that, that this world seen in its pristine beauty, you know, the, the beauty of, 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 a, of a deep blue sky, of, of, of green fields, 
that those elemental colors in juxtaposition is in fact the landscape of Eden. That if, if we were designing a world, designing a perfect world, we might you know, want a blue sky and a green field. You know, that is now obviously we've evolved on this planet. And so we respond to environmental you know, features of the world in ways that we've, you know, that, 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 we, that we can embrace, right? Um, if, you know, it, it would be a sort of a, almost a failed biological adaptation if we were to see the basic features of the earth as fundamentally unappealing or ugly. That's, that's not, right, the human experience. And I use that aphorism, by the way, at the end of um, Phalaris's book. And, and I have a story about it, I just want to tell. Um, some years ago, shortly after I'd written it, I was talking to a neighbor and mentioned that aphorism. Now, this neighbor happened to have been a writer, um, a woman maybe in her 40s. Um, she, she received the aphorism, um, didn't say very much. Um, again, blues, greens, aquamarines, right? Sky, field, ocean, sea, right? Who could have imagined? And it wasn't clear that, you know, it had made an impact on her. Then a couple of days later, I was out um, at my front lawn, and and I see I see this woman across the street, and and she sees me, and she starts running towards me, and and when she gets closer, she basically sort of hugs me, you know, just runs up to me and embraces me, and and she says that aphorism that you told me. I can't get it out of my mind. It seems to me the single most beautiful thing I've heard. Well, she obviously at some point came to, to, to see what I see in it, what was my motivation for writing it in the first place. That sense of, again, elemental colors, blues and greens, is something that um, became the centerpiece of an anecdote also in Phalaris's bowl that I've mentioned in the past involving my father. And, and I'll just, I'll tell it again now just because of its importance to me, but also to the subject, to what we're talking about, you know, um, in terms of this conjunction of philosophy and the poetry of the earth. Right? That, that the poetry of Earth is the logic of Eden. Right? That's another way of saying what, you know, what I'm expressing, I think. But my father, as again, I've, I've mentioned before, um, was, not, was not a highly educated man. He was not an intellectual. He was a factory worker um, for, you know, for the majority of his life. Um, he worked um, in dress factories. And and he didn't have, you know, like, but, but he had a, a deep and abiding intuition. So he wouldn't necessarily be able to have like a, a discussion with me about some of the you know, philosophical aspects, you know, of my writing, but, he had a sense of what I was doing and what it amounted to. And one day I went to his apartment and I ran by some new aphorisms that I'd written. And, and his response was for me arresting and probably the most penetrating characterization of 
my philosophical work that I've, I've ever heard from anybody. He said to me, Stephen, I can't claim to understand your philosophical writings, but when I hear your words, I see blue skies and fresh fields. Oh, there it is again. He's describing the landscape of Eden. And that's what he felt in the words. So even though he wasn't necessarily you know, able to articulate you know, a lot of the, you know, the philosophical meaning or implications of what I'm saying, he was able to intuit what it amounted to, its significance, right? Its fundamental meaning. As, and, and, and that characterization you know, captures it as well as anybody ever has. And again, we're talking about certain elemental features of the earth that embody you know, my sense of the goal of philosophy, to return us to, to Eden, if you like, or to, to reveal the Eden around us and, and reveal it in, again, some of these fundamental features of of this world. When I was writing the books of Joshua, which is a book of poetry that actually touches on a number of issues relating to, to the earth, um, its significance for us. And one of those, well, there's a little passage I'm going to be reading a little bit later. Um, well, there's a section in the books of Joshua where I decided I wanted to do something that I heard was not achievable, namely to rhyme orange, the word orange. It's often been said that in English, there is no word that specifically captures its rhyme. Well, now obviously, Pronunciation changes, different dialects, you know, of English of any language will pronounce things slightly differently. So in one dialect, there might be something that rhymes that you know, doesn't rhyme so well in some other you know, dialect, or you know, as the language evolves, things might, you know, you know, we might lose some of those rhyming you know, aspects. But orange, well. Here's what I wrote. A deep blue sky, again, back to the theme of blue, right? A blue sky. A deep blue sky that we singe on high turns to orange by and by. Singe, S-I-N-G-E, to sort of burn. Um, orange, singe orange. The way I pronounce it, or the way it's pronounced, I think, in you know, in, in the United States, singe and orange rhyme. So there. And that particular line is, is really describing one of the most compelling features of the earth. It's describing a sunset, right? A deep blue sky that we singe. What's singeing the atmosphere? What's singeing the sky? The sun. And by and by, as the sun sets, sky turns to orange. So a deep blue sky that we singe on high turns to orange by and by. So I was able to capture, you know, it was able to rhyme it, but in a way that captures some of the essential fundamental beauty, you know, of, of this world, right? Let's see something. Okay, um, so that's some stuff that I've written. But another thing that came to my mind, you know, again, with the topic, is a work of music by a 19th century composer, German composer and conductor, Gustav Mahler, M-A-H-L-E-R. It's a work called Das Lied von der Erde, The Song of the Earth. Uh, for obvious reasons, it pertains to what we're discussing, into Earth Day. 
Now, there are a number of elements of this work. Um, and let me give you some, some of the context. Mahler was, is considered one of the great symphonic composers. He, Das Lied von der Erde, is not a numbered symphony though. It's actually the ninth symphony that he wrote, but he didn't number it and call it a symphony. He called it Das Lied von der Erde in order to avoid a curse. And the curse that had that people were sort of convinced of um, towards the end of the 19th century was that great composers could write nine symphonies and no more. Beethoven wrote nine symphonies, did not live to finish a tenth. Schubert, the same, nine symphonies. Bruckner, the same, nine symphonies. And those are some of the great symphonic composers. So Mahler tried to thwart this curse that he imagined um, prevailing by, again, not numbering it. So it is a symphony, um, Das Lied von der Erde. Um, it's a symphony set to some classical Chinese poetry that um, was translated um, into German by, um, by a German poet, um, then paraphrased um, into German, and then modified by Mahler. So there is a, um, it, it, it went through a lot of transformations before the poetry found its way into this work of music, which is a symphony, but with voices, right? Two voices that sing the words of, of the text. The, turns out Mahler completed the work. Um, then he went on to write what he numbered as the ninth, his ninth symphony, that turned out to be his last symphony. So he did in fact end up composing nine numbered symphonies and in a sense, not escaping what he'd been trying to avoid. But Das Lied von der Erde is often considered his greatest musical composition. That was the view that Leonard Bernstein took of it. Now, Leonard Bernstein was a 20th century American musician, one of the most gifted musical talents the United States has ever produced. Um, Bernstein was a distinguished conductor, um, conductor of the New York Philharmonic. He was probably the first um, conductor, American conductor trained in America to achieve international status and recognition as a conductor. He was also an educator. Um, he gave a series of, of public television um, talks in I think the 1950s and 1960s, introducing people, especially younger people, to classical music. Um, I think the series was called I forget actually what the series is called, The Young Person's Guide to the Orchestra, maybe, I'm not sure. But they were talks that displayed his, his ability to communicate in, in terms that could make the, the sophisticated, the, the, the difficult, um, the challenging, understandable and, and compelling to people. He was also a composer. Um, he composed classical pieces, but is most famous, most celebrated as a composer for the musical, the Broadway musical, West Side Story, which was subsequently made into a film and is being made into a film again, um, being redone by Steven Spielberg. Um, I think that's going to be released probably within the year. Um, so, and, and that's probably the work that will preserve Bernstein's reputation as a composer um, 
the best of all his works. It also turns out that Leonard Bernstein had gone to Harvard. Um, he, when he was at Harvard, he was um, for a time an accompanist um, for the Harvard Glee Club. Well, when, when I was at Harvard, one of my roommates was president of the Harvard Glee Club. Because of Bernstein's association with Harvard, having graduated and having been involved in other ways, he would use the Harvard Glee Club in various performances and recordings that my roommate would participate in. Um, he got to know Bernstein. Unfortunately, when he knew Bernstein, I had not yet developed a really deeper appreciation for what Bernstein was aiming for and, and what he was aiming for in his conducting in particular was salvation. He would conduct a piece of music as if that music offered a solution to the world. Well, that's also what Mahler was aiming for, like in his compositions, in his symphonies. For Mahler, a symphony was like a novel. It attempted to achieve a broad panorama, you know, of, of life, of life on earth. That's again what Das Lied von der Erde is, you know, is concerned with, um, where both the, the beauty, the, the tragedy, the ecstasy, the transcendence of the experience of life on this earth is, is represented. Now, Das Lied von der Erde was composed towards the end of, of Mahler's life. And by, by the time you know, he was writing it, he was like burdened with a sense of his own mortality. Um, his, his doctors, in fact, had advised him to stop composing because they thought it was too much of a strain on his heart. Well, Mahler defied that advice. But Das Lied von der Erde and his later works, and really, you find this throughout all of his works, there's a sense of melancholy because of an awareness of the beauty of the earth. The, 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 the beauty of its, of, its, of its dimensions, its aspects, the beauty of human life on earth, and the sadness, the infinite sadness of having to leave it one day. Right? The, the, the infinite sadness of mortality as Mahler experienced it. There's now there's a section, as I said, in, oh, and here, let me, let me play you, just so you hear what I'm talking about, just a few opening measures from Das Lied von der Erde, just so you can see the kind of music, the kind of piece that we're talking about. Let me see if... Okay, just to give you a sense. Now, it turns out that performance is, in fact, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. And it also features a singer, an opera singer, famous opera singer, who just died, um, I think, a, a week or two, or very recently, um, Krista Ludwig. Um, Krista Ludwig was a great um, German mezzo-soprano. I actually saw her in a performance of Fidelio, Beethoven's opera, um, in London once. She received a 20-minute standing ovation. So she is in this recording um, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. So you get a sense of, of the drama of the work. Well, what I want to read you is the poetic appreciation of Mahler and Das Lied von der Erde 
that I wrote in the books of Joshua. Okay, it's it's a few stanzas of verse. Again, it's poetry. Let me let me just find it. Okay. And I think some of what I just told you as an introduction will, I think, help orient. And then I'll maybe make some comments about a few of the, of the ideas. Let's see here. Okay. And again, Mahler was a composer and conductor. And he tended to conduct during like the symphonic season, which goes from the fall to the spring, and during the summer would compose. Um, it was during the summers that his doctors wanted him to desist, to, to rest, not to compose and save his health, um, which again, Mahler ignored. Um, fortunately, Mahler ignored that advice. We have his symphonies, but um, here's how the passage goes. Mahler composed when not conducting to keep himself from self-destructing. While his players estivated, Mahler transitionally created in music for a disjunct age about to show through the haze, horror or death or anxiety would name the dawning century patiently and inexorably. And Mahler penned its anthem at summer's ease in nine or 10 strident symphonies and a song of the earth to thwart a curse. But near the end, Mahler's heart would send intimations of mortality in syncopations of diminished vitality. The doctors ordered him to bed but Mahler chose to compose instead and leave to his wife, to Alma, hymns to a fading life. And as a sign of things to come and left undone, Joshua applauded Mahler's decision that medical thinking needed revision, convinced that Mahler had won, that this was how a life should be run, regardless of the sum, in minutes hours, years, or beats of a drum. Okay, so um, a couple of comments about that. Estivated just means to like spend the summer, you know, doing something. Um, and I make a reference there to Alma. Alma was his, was Mahler's wife. Um, and just a comment about her. Um, she was a composer um, herself. Um, but a fascinating woman who lived a fascinating life. Um, she was married to Mahler. Um, when Mahler died, um, she met and married the architect Walter Gropius, one of the great architects of the 20th century. Um, at some point before or after, she had a relationship with Oscar Kokoschka, one of the great expressionist painters of the 20th century. And there was, there's a, an annual lecture given at the Harvard Design School, the Walter Gropius Lecture. And when I was there, I was interested in architecture. Um, when I was a student there, I went to one of those lectures and Alma Mahler was present. I didn't meet her, but she was in the room. So, um, it turns out apparently there's, there, are, there are written accounts that she's given of of Mahler, Mahler the man, Mahler the composer, but um, supposedly not quite so accurate. Um, same thing apparently is true of Mozart's wife. Um, her, her representations of Mozart, again, um, leave something to be desired in terms of um, an ac accurate depiction you know, of, of the man and, and the creator. Okay, so, oh, and then one other thing about the Song of the Earth, just to tie it in to what I was saying before in terms of the sense of Earth, right? The Earth as, you know, the, the, the image of Eden seen through untainted eyes. I guess a 
passage is another passage somewhere else where I use that kind of metaphor. But um, I just um, wanted to show you. Um, das Lied von der Erde consists of six movements um, to six different, again, classic Chinese poems, um, but translated into German. And the English of the final poem is, the dear earth everywhere blossoms in spring and grows green anew. Everywhere and forever blue is the horizon, forever, forever. Again, the, there's, I've mentioned in previous talks, a comment that Emerson, the American philosopher Emerson made about how um, great nations, great spirits have not been boasters or buffoons, but perceivers of the terror of life. Well, Mahler's experience of life wasn't so much of its terror, but of its sadness, right? The, 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 the melancholy, again, of, of having to one day lose it. And it kind of reminds me um, of a comment that the American writer William Faulkner, an American novelist, um, once made. He said, um, given a choice between suffering in this world and oblivion, right, non-existence, I choose suffering, no matter how extreme. Yeah. So again, in Mali, there's that sense of the reluctance to leave the earth because of its inherent beauty. And, and it's a beauty that still pertains. And it's a beauty that, that owes to our being adapted to this world, to seeing you know, the sky as we do, to seeing the green and responding to it as we do. Okay. Oh, and, and by the way, as far as there's a philosophical issue here, about what we're seeing, right? Like, is the blue that I'm seeing the same character, the same tonality as the blue that you would be seeing? And of course, the answer is we can't know, ever. Not knowable, right? And the fact that we cannot know, because we cannot step into another person's perspective, right? sufficient to be able to decide that issue. And even if we could step inside another person's body, another person's skin, we couldn't be sure that we were not seeing things colored with our mode of perception. So, and, and I've, I think I've made this point before as well that the fact that we cannot do such a thing, the fact that we cannot know that another person's experience of color is the same as ours, is more significant about the nature of the world, the nature of existence, the nature of our circumstances, the nature of the solution to what we're addressing than any frustration in our inability to to achieve that understanding, right? Okay, so here's our. This is our world. This is the world that we've we've grown up in. This is the world that we've evolved in. The most important aspect of our circumstance, of the circumstance of existence itself, is that we cannot leave the world to view it from the outside can't leave the world. I mean, we can leave a planet, see the planet from a distance, but not leave existence behind, so far as, as we can know. But we think we can, right? We, we are, again, it's a point I've, I've stressed before, our sense of reality is of the world seen independently of ourselves. It's I could call it the fundamental illusion, 
it's certainly a fundamental illusion. Um, in, in some of my representations, I'll consider it, I do consider it the fundamental source of human suffering. The, the belief that we can see the world from the outside. It's, it's a belief that is ultimately facilitated, encouraged, enabled by, by language, by the function of language to achieve social ends, social coordination, to sort of allow us to see things or to embrace other people as, as equals in some sense to ourselves and so as worthy and appropriate for association. But it's, it's, it's an illusion that falls short of the rigor of our circumstance. Of course, the fact that we have this tendency to think that we can see the world independently, you know, that we can see the world, we can, see, we can be outside and looking down on the world as if we were God or a God, or again, as if we were, you know, just able to see objective reality independently of our particular circumstances. Well, the fact that we cannot leave the world means that we inevitably will change the world. Every existing thing, every living thing, changes the world by virtue of its existence. Living things tend to change the earth more than other kinds of things. Like at, at one time, the earth was, was bare. There was no like life on the surface of the earth. The land was barren because ultraviolet radiation from the sun was too intense to support life. Radiation from the sun without adequate shielding in some way will basically mutate DNA of living things, will, will destroy complex molecules, will make life impossible. Life did not develop on land. L the land did not turn green until photosynthetic organisms arose in the oceans that were capable of taking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and, and, and releasing oxygen, leading to a buildup in the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere to now it's 20%. And that amount of oxygen is able to support the formation of an ozone layer, which absorbs ultraviolet radiation from the sun and makes life on the surface of the earth exposed you know, to the sun possible. So living things transform the world. Living things change the world. That is what it means to exist at all. It's a matter of degree, right? Now, when I was younger, I spent some summers studying geology and, and the history of the earth. And one of the things that, now this was some years ago, this was before global warming. Um, one of the things that, you know, that impresses anybody that studies the history of earth is how many extreme environmental changes the earth has undergone in its history. And, and again, those changes can be facilitated by living things. And the more living things there are, or the more of any given type of living thing that there are, the more an impact those life forms will have on the environment. Living things inevitably, inexorably change the world. Now, 
One thing that I've, I've stressed is we presume more than we know, right? We suffer that we presume more than we know. We think we know where things are going. We think we know where our best interests lie. Well, that's a fundamental um, limitation, you know, of the common sense view of the world. We, we don't. <laughs> um, and, and the beginning of the Western philosophical tradition um, with Socrates, I've mentioned this on many occasions, attests to what we do not know, right? We don't know, as Socrates articulated, whether life is greater than death, is superior to death, right? When Socrates is condemned to death, he says to his friends, and so you are separate ways, you to live and I to die, and which is better, only God knows. But we think we know, right? desperately, erroneously. We also tend to be anthropocentric, right? We, we are focused on ourselves, on our, our own survival, right? Um, that's part of what evolution sort of promotes to encourage the survival of species. If you are looking out for your own survival, you are more likely to survive. So, and one of the most important aspects of, of any living organism, human being, you know, to insects or one-celled organisms, is that they, they're adapted to very narrow environmental circumstances. Most living things are capable of, of, of experiencing temperatures from, oh, like 10 degrees Celsius to, to 30 degrees, 40 degrees, um, atmospheric pressures of one atmosphere, um, certain the level of oxygen in the atmosphere you know, has to be within very narrow limits. Um, acidity, the pH um, of, of, our, of our body um, um, fluids um, operates within narrow limits. So we exist, we thrive within very narrow environmental circumstances. It doesn't take much for our personal existence, survival, to be threatened, right? We, we can only go for a few minutes without oxygen or enough oxygen. We can only go 20, 30 minutes if we're submerged in, in icy water. We can go a few days without water. We can go a couple of months without food, but you know, what we're, you know, we, we are operating within fairly strong constraints. So it's obviously in our interest to maintain environmental conditions within the limits, within the parameters that we are adapted to, right? Now, there are forms of life on Earth that are adapted to extremes, extremes of pressure, of temperature deep under the ocean or in environments where you would think life wouldn't be possible. But those are only individual species. Life itself is capable of, in, of, of, of exploiting, of, of occupying a broad range of environmental niches, circumstances. But any given organism, any given species, narrow circumstances. The, our intelligence, on the other hand, does allow for adaptability. In fact, it's said that that's the main evolutionary advantage of intelligence, that it makes us adaptable. It makes us capable of solving problems and finding ways of accommodating to circumstances that without you know, a measure of creative response 
will, will be fatal. But still, Now, one of the things that I've mentioned when we've talked about this type of issue before is that we want to maintain the earth as it is so that the species that are thriving on the earth under these conditions can continue to thrive, including ourselves. But, So far as we know, we might be here to prepare the way for something else. Remember, we change the world. Every living thing changes the world. If you want to, if you want living things to have less impact, then you need fewer numbers of such living things, fewer numbers of such individuals. The human population is now at a level where it's, it's changing everything, right? Um, technology amplifies those, that capacity for change. Technology makes it possible for us to dramatically change things, to, to multiply the impact that any given, that, you know, that small numbers of human beings would have on the world machinery does that, right? Our, our technologies tend to have a, a, an extreme impact, at least in potential, on the environment, on the world. So as much as any living thing changes the world by, by just what it needs to do to survive, what it consumes, um, the waste it generates, right? And all living things generate waste. Well, in addition to that, we, you know, our, our technologies, you know, can dramatically alter different aspects of the environment. Okay. Now, I mentioned that when I was younger, I studied geology and that um, throughout its history, the temperature of the earth, for example, has fluctuated wildly. Yeah. Um, it's been much hotter in the past. It's been much colder in the past. Living things have evolved under those different types of circumstances. There is a question. To what degree are human beings causing the global changes that we're observing? To what degree are human beings, is human activity the ultimate cause of current global warming, for example, environmental change, climate change? Scientists do lots of studies, do lots of modeling. Um, it's a question of what's causing it, right? What's causing the warming? Is it human activity or is it some other bi you know, biological, geological process such as has taken place in the past before there were ever human beings. So question is causation. And in, in the course of this pandemic, I think there've been like in, in online, in, in, in the news, a lot of discussion of, well, you know, developing like drugs, developing vaccines, and 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 testing, right? Testing them to make sure that they're effective, and and exploring. Um, in the case of in, in the case of like the coronavirus, um, what are the effects it's having? You know, what are the things that it's causing? I've mentioned, and, and I think you've probably heard about um, in science, observational studies where you observe a connection between things, but it doesn't necessarily prove that one thing is causing the other. There might be something else causing both. So for example, there's a lot of 
there is you know, a lot of like environmental change taking place. Um, that's a reality. The, the uh, ambient temperature of the earth has been rising slowly, but you know, significantly over the last century or so since we've been you know, high, highly heavily industrialized. Is it human activity that's causing that or something else? Well, again, we observe the change, but in order to establish a cause, we have to do an experiment. We have to do a controlled experiment, right? If Again, when you ever you hear discussions in, in science on scientific like, results, there are studies that are observational that establish a connection between two things, an association between two things, but that do not necessarily, do not in and of themselves establish that one thing is causing the other. In order to establish that, you have to do a controlled experiment where you take one thing in one set of circumstances, you take an identical thing in another set of circumstances, and you see how they behave. In other words, you have to do a controlled experiment. It's, um, it reminds me of, um, there was an ancient Greek Order. I think it was Demosthenes, but, but I'm not sure. I tried to look it up earlier and I, and I couldn't find the quotation that I was interested in. But so I'm not sure exactly who it was. Maybe Demosthenes, a famous Greek orator, um, um, political figure. Someone from Athens, someone came to him, um, someone jealous came to him and said, you know, if if you hadn't been born in Athens, you wouldn't be famous. You owe your fame to the city. And Demosthenes replies, if I, if, and I think this person might have been from, let's say, Corinth, I don't remember exactly, but another Greek city. Um, Demosthenes said to him, if I had been born in Corinth and you had been born in Athens, neither of us would have been famous. Well, it's, it's a clever retort. Um, there's no way of knowing whether it's true or not, right? Um, and, and I mean, so far, you know, we, we cannot ever do that kind of experiment. We can't rewind time. We can't manipulate things to really determine, like, for example, the effect of an of environment versus genetics on on some result can't do the experiment. Well, I've I think I've I've explored on a number of occasions how in this world we cannot ever under any circumstances do a controlled experiment because and there are a number of sort of aspects of this. The simplest is because the world is different in different directions. The asymmetry of the world means that where our experimental, our control group are always going to be in different environments, subtly, slightly, perhaps, but different. And from the standpoint of rigor and the possibility of achieving a rigorously controlled experiment, any difference undercuts the rigor of the enterprise. Any difference, because the difference in, in environment can account for any difference in outcome. The simple point is, and it's, it's, it's a deep point, we cannot in this world ever, under any circumstances, facing any given issue, establish definitive causation period. The asymmetry of the world, the fundamental conditions of existence make it theoretically impossible. We can do it approximately. Any two things might be approximately the same. In other words, we can carry out these experiments in heuristic space, not epistemic space. In other words, we cannot do them rigorously. 
there's actually something that I write, wrote about this that summarizes it. And I think, let me, let me read this quickly. I see we have some time. Um, okay. Let's get it. Okay. The solution to the problem of human suffering is existence. That two points in any conceptual space, two objects with identical properties are distinguishable because of which we cannot perfectly control an experiment and cannot validate a conclusion, except in the oversimplifications of our mind. And so science is aesthetics and heuristics. It's logic, a theoretical impossibility. We can do controlled experiments mentally, not physically. So as to say, we suffer not existentially, but in thought. The point of individuation is salvation. That summarizes, again, a point that I've made a number of times about the theoretical impossibility and the significance of the impossibility of being, of, of being able to do controlled experiments. We cannot theoretically do them because of the nature of existence itself. And that that the nature of existence is also central, fundamental to the dignity of existence and is also fundamental, central to the conditions of salvation that would apply to any of us, need not apply to anyone else under any circumstances. But, so, there's a, um, there was a woman that was in the news a few days ago from Florida, um, who has a school, a private school that she established. And at this private school, um, she has decided not to allow anyone to teach who becomes vaccinated because of some conspiracy theories that she's um, subscribed, subscribes to about the possibility of vaccinated individuals somehow um, adversely affecting um, people that are not vaccinated. Um, and, and she had another objection, and that was that the vaccines are experimental. Well, the fact of the matter is every aspect of life is experimental in the sense that there's always some difference that pertains to each new experience or to each person's experience relative to anyone else's experience or to each person's experience relative to their experience yesterday or the day before. And so you cannot ever know in advance how or whether something will work in a given way, no matter what. When when in medical school, one's introduced to different rotations like surgery, the first thing they do is take you around and show you all the things that can go wrong. That like the first day of surgery, we were taken around the hospital and shown patients who came in for some simple procedure, a tonsillectomy, an appendectomy, and we're still in the hospital a year later because of something that went wrong. When the first day we were introduced to anesthesiology, we were told that at some point in your career, you will sedate a patient, give a patient anesthesia. That patient might have responded successfully to anesthesia under you know, dozens of previous occasions, let's say, with previous surgeries, will have no history of an adverse reaction. And one time, you will give the patient the anesthesia and the patient will never wake up. Things always can happen because there's always differences that pertain. It's the fundamental nature of our circumstances. Okay, but as I've, as I've said in the past, if we want to achieve a goal, and let's say the goal is controlling our environment so that it doesn't become incompatible with our 
our life, our existence, then we are operating within heuristic space, not rigorous space, and the logic is that of convergence. And the fundamental principle of convergence is some order of convergence, some number of elements brought together will, in principle, be capable of achieving any given result, any given goal. You want to get to Mars, you want to get to the moon, enough resources, enough enterprise can achieve those goals in principle. If you haven't yet achieved them, more convergent features, add more elements to the picture. In order to achieve a, a large goal, an ambitious goal, you typically need lots of convergent elements. Well, in the case of achieving goals relating to climate control, where we have 8 billion human beings contributing to the issue, well, the more of those human beings that participate in an effort to address the problem, the more likely we are to achieve a successful result. The problem, of course, is that the experience in the pandemic has shown us the difficulty, even when it's a matter of, of, of imminent life and death, to get that satisfactory or necessary degree of coordination of human beings. That uh, in this country, it's been hard to have everybody wearing masks. Something as simple as that, that could have prevented maybe hundreds of thousands of deaths. So anything is possible as long as you have sufficient numbers, sufficient coordination, sufficient convergence. But again, it's a, it's a matter of achieving a goal that in principle is achievable if everyone sees that it's sufficiently in their interest to do so. One of the problems with addressing the climate issue is the changes are subtle. They happen slowly. They happen imperceptibly. Right? A one degree change in temperature over a century can produce a catastrophic outcome, but yet you don't observe it on a daily basis. So it can be difficult to get that degree of coordination, but the, the good news is that in principle, it is always possible with enough enterprise, enough effort, enough coordination, and as we saw in the case of the pandemic, enough technology, enough innovation, that also can produce remarkable results. And, and, and ultimately, it's a matter of preserving right, the beauty of that earth, right? The beauty of the earth that for me is embodied in our dreams of Eden, right? That blue skies and fresh fields that we want to be able to continue to, to be nourished by and inspired by and transfigured by. Okay, now one thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna conclude now um, and I'll, I'll address questions with a little philosophic work that I was going to recite or read last week. I'll read it now. It's, um, it connects, again, to the issue. It, it, it deals with the issue of time, but also of, of the earth, and especially the, the last line. And it's a poem. It's in poetic form, keeping with our theme of um, the United States' National Poetry Month. So... Here is this short work, an aphoristic work in poetic form. It's called Towers of Powers. Um, think of towers as structures casting shadows, and the shadows become a way of keeping time and keeping track of movement, the movement of the earth. Towers of Powers by the Hours. One, time is does not reveal all things real. The same as that we claim. A world conveys the questions we raise in tokens of days. 
mysteries or ancient histories far, far from what we are. Towers paint by hours. Our sands show the hands of stars. Okay, so, and when we think of sands, the sands of the earth, the sands of our beaches, the sands of the land, hands of stars, um, you see, um, basically, we, the elements of earth were formed inside the interiors of distant stars, millennia, yeah, millions of years ago. Okay. Um, I think that's a reasonable point at which to conclude tonight's talk. Um, let me address the questions from last time, and um, we'll see if we have time for any new questions tonight. Um, last time, there were two questions left that we didn't have time to address. Let me just pull them up here. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay. Um, okay, the first question. Um, actually, well, I'll do the first question first. Um, now, the person apologizes for the question. I'm sorry for my question. Never a reason to apologize for a question, no matter what, right? Um, remember Einstein? Um, computers are useless. They only give answers. It's questions, ultimately, that guide thought and guide discovery. Um, I'm sorry for my question. Um, what do you think about the state language of Kazakhstan? Um, could you explain from the philosophical side, because I think we need to pay more attention to developing digital Kazakhstan. Okay. I am going to address this from a philosophical perspective point of view. What's interesting about philosophy almost uniquely is no major philosopher has ever written philosophy in an acquired language, in something other than a language that they were effectively born into. Now, it's not always been the vernacular language. Um, in the Middle Ages, it was Latin, right? There was a vernacular language, like a common language that people would speak, and then there was the learned language of Latin, the language of the church. But you know, people in general were introduced to Latin from a young age, so someone like Newton um, was able to write the Principia, the Principia um, in Latin um, easily because he had been you know, acculturated to that language from a young age. It was effectively a mother tongue for him. In the case of philosophy, no major philosopher has written in anything other than a language, either a mother tongue or a secondary language like Latin acquired you know, from the youngest age. There have been lots of examples of philosophers who were gifted at languages, had tremendous facility, but even so only wrote in their native tongue. So the most famous example is that of Kierkegaard. Um, Kierkegaard was a Danish philosopher, um, the greatest Danish philosopher, which he thought was almost an insult. He didn't want to be considered the greatest Danish philosopher. He thought he had a, a rank to be considered one of the greatest philosophers of any culture, of any language. And, and he was, he is, he ranks at you know, at the highest level you know, of philosophical achievement. But even though he was good at languages, he, he knew you know, a variety of, of them, he only ever wrote in Danish. And it was a source of anguish to him because it meant that he had a limited audience. Right? The number of people that could read and speak Danish in the world is, is very limited. So Kierkegaard felt frustrated that his ideas were not able to reach you know, the greater world because of the small population 
that his that that spoke you know his native tongue. It wasn't until he was translated, right, translated into English into other languages, um, a century later, almost you know, after, or half a century, that he began to be appreciated and 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 began to assimilate into world philosophical culture and understanding. It was a source of constant anguish to him. Wittgenstein was also gifted at languages. He, he studied Russian. Um, he lived in England for many years. Um, was fluent at English, um, never wrote except in German, never wrote philosophy, but in German. That is not true for other fields of human endeavor. Um, there have been great writers who have achieved greatness in acquired languages. The example that I'm most familiar with is Joseph Conrad the great American, um, not American, English novelist who was of Polish descent. Um, he, Polish was his native language and he did not learn English until he was 19. And yet from that point forward, he was able to emerge as one of the greatest of all English novelists, one of the greatest of all English writers. But again, that is not a phenomenon that we see with philosophy. With philosophy, the subtlety of expression is such that you need the familiarity of a native tongue. So, the Kazakh language, from the philosophical standpoint, presents the issue of having you know, a limited body of speakers. I, I looked it up, I think that around the world there might be 22 million speakers of Kazakh, I think within Kazakhstan, maybe six million, six and a half or five million, something on that order. Russian obviously is, you know, the, the secondary language, right? Also official though. Um, I think when, um, when your previous president, when the previous president of Kazakhstan, um, Nazar Baev, um, resigned, he gave a speech in which he announced that in the future he saw Russian, Kazakh, and English as being languages that would be mastered by the population of Kazakhstan. Well, from the from a philosophical standpoint, as much as I feel that it's possible to achieve any elevation of philosophical thought or expression in any language in terms of having an audience that can receive one's works without translation. So there's nothing lost. There's, you know, it's, it's, it's directly understandable. English obviously is, is the best choice these days. Um, but Yes, I, apparently there's been a movement um, recently in Kazakhstan to adopt the Latin alphabet for, um, for Kazakh to make it you know, a little easier um, to, to interface with you know, all types of online you know, platforms and you know, all types of professional circles. Um, that, it, again, anything that promotes you know, an ease of communication and a degree of understanding, you know, um, that, that facilitates the, the robustness of the language and its ability to communicate is desirable. But um, again, the, the frustration, you know, if, I mean, my embrace of English is just, it was, it's the language I was born with. It's the language I was born into. It happens at the moment to be the universal language, you know, as close you know, as to Latin, say, during the Middle Ages, as any existing language. Um, so I suppose I would aim for facility in, in English, no matter what 
my native language might be, but I would aim for facility in English from a very young age so that it could serve me as say Latin did during the Middle Ages. But um, yes, I think um, efforts at modernizing, efforts at um, sort of um, making it easier um, to, um, to work with Kazakh um, online um, are all you know, working in, I think, a reasonable direction. Um, again, what's unique about the philosophic situation is that one can't acquire a language later in life and write philosophy cogently, compellingly, and creatively. At least it hasn't been done. Okay, so that's one question. The other question I have here is one that um, is actually the second part of the question I had begun to answer last time about Stoicism. Um, I wanted to add another question related to Stoicism. What do you recommend to read articles, books to learn more about it? Okay, for me, there are two sources for Stoicism. It's something that I've been close to um, in my own life. And when I was younger, I read Stoic, Stoic works assiduously. I, I, I was um, drawn to Stoicism. Um, the two most compelling Stoics that I would recommend are Epictetus, E P. I-C-T-E-T-U-S, Epictetus, a Greek philosopher, Greek Stoic philosopher, who um, actually became a, a slave um, under the Roman Empire and taught Stoicism, taught his philosophy to the emperor Marcus Aurelius, who is the other great historical Stoic. So those two individuals, Epictetus, a Greek philosopher slave, and Marcus Aurelius, a Roman emperor, A-U-R-E-L-I-U-S, Aurelius, are probably the two most celebrated Stoics. I mean, I, I rank them in terms of my estimation of their work above, say, a Stoic like Seneca. Um, Marcus Aurelius wrote a work called the Meditations. Epictetus wrote a work called, I mean, these were probably assembled by others, and maybe they represented, in the case of Epictetus, it might have been others that wrote down, you know, the talks that he would give, explanations that he offered. But um, he wrote, or we have a collected set of works attributed to Epictetus um, called the Discourses, and there's a short work, a manual of Stoicism um, by Epictetus called the Enchiridion, E-N-C-H-R-I-D-I-O-N, Enchiridion. Um, but if you look up Epictetus, you'll find references to the Discourses and to the Enchiridion and Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. Is it Meditations? I think. Marcus Aurelius, he gives us one work. So Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus are the two Stoic authors I recommend. And in the Enchiridion, one of the summary representations of Stoicism um, goes like this. Um, Remember you are an actor in such a play as the author may choose, if short, in a short one if long, in a long one, if you are to play the part of a poor person or a private citizen or a ruler, see that you act well the part, for that is your duty, to act well the given part, but to select the part belongs to another. So, I mean, central to Stoicism, the idea of accepting you know, circumstances that you cannot otherwise change. Um, one of the problems with what I just recited is 
It's again, imagining that we can see, experience the world from the outside, where the writer is almost putting himself in the perspective of a God, right? Selecting, you know, a destiny or a life where we don't know what has been selected for us. So it's, we have a degree of freedom that that view of our circumstances doesn't fully embrace. It's, um, it reminds me of the circumstance of Van Gogh, who wanted to be a pastor, wanted to be a religious teacher, and thought that was his destiny, that was his life. He wasn't successful at that, um, and at some point he abandoned it. If he had followed the Stoic advice, he might have just pursued it and tried to you know, make the best of it. Um, but he abandoned it and, and turned to painting and you know, became the most popular great painter in history. Well, you know, was, was that the role that was selected for him? He didn't know that, he discovered that. So the same thing with our circumstances. We don't know you know, what role might have been selected for us. We have you know, greater freedom in our circumstances to make decisions. And, and as I've stressed, the future will decide. The future will decide the past. The future will decide what our role was. We can't know that in advance. And so our actions need not be constrained by a sense of what that role might be. It's not like we're seeing a theater page with our name, you know, associated with a certain role in a play. So, um, so stoicism, you know, has, from my perspective, its limitations. Um, but that's simply to say that, you know, the work of people 2000 years ago, which is what is when Epictetus and Marcus Furius lived, isn't the final word, that there's been a point to the last 2,000 years of intellectual and philosophical thought and, and development. So um, I, I embrace you know, a, the kind of philosophical principles that I've been discussing over those of traditional classic Stoicism. For me, the results that I've been describing to you have been more powerful in my personal experience. Okay, um, do we have time or other questions or how are we doing? Are there any other questions? Thank you very questions? much, Stephen. This talk has been great. We have included so much. And honestly, we do have a lot of questions to do, a lot. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, so we don't really have enough time, but let me yeah. quickly read out the questions that are okay. going to be answered in the next session. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Daniel, for joining us weekly. We really appreciate your feedback, your comments, and then your questions. Thank you very much, Daniel. And he says, hello, everyone. Also, we have new people coming. Thank you, Saltnat, for joining us today. And thank you, Ali Beck. Hello. Hi. Um, now let me read out the questions very quick before we finish up. Question number one, what about if we see on the, sorry, on the world through engineering way? Instead of sky and fields, what would it be? Okay. Then the second comment, don't worry, my father also cannot understand my engineering philosophy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, the next uh, question, blue sky changed to orange, what does it mean? I prefer two colors actually in ice cream. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the next uh, question. Sorry, I agree about classic music, but what about Alex Boy from A Clockwork Orange? He also has listened, but had so bad temper. Uh, the next one. Sorry about Change the World. The movie prayed forward. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. uh, but can we control our science experiments? Uh, the next uh, question. Sorry, when I was mentioned about controlled science experiment, that means engineering way, not with people and pets. And also with vaccine, I agree, lots of problems are everywhere. And the next one, yeah, 
Yeah, thank you, Danny. Thank you for your questions. And those are all for today. Okay. Well, good. Now, we're not going to meet next week, right? So we're going to take a week off um, for a holiday. And then I'll be able to address those questions and other questions that might come up during the next talk in our, on our next talk in two weeks, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So people have to sort of wait, you know, one extra week for answers that will be forthcoming. I promise you, I will address them all. So okay. first of all, again, thank you very much, Stephen, for such an amazing talk. Thank you for playing the music, for showing us so much that you have been uh, experiencing. And thank you very much, you all, for joining us today. We would like to thank again the U.S. Consulate General here in Almaty, American Space Almaty, and our amazing and great speaker, the New York Times approved uh, scientist and philosopher and artist, uh, Stephen Frequent. Thank you very much. And you guys, please stay safe. We hope to see you on May 14th. And we will definitely answer all your questions and, uh, you know, Read out your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Have a great night or day, and, and I'll see you in two weeks. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Hope to see you all soon.